Happy New Year. Long time no talk. Um, so really this video is more like an update. Um, I haven't been making a lot of videos lately just because, well, I mean, I'm getting kind of busy. So, and I haven't found like a really good topic to talk about that hasn't been covered by somebody better. Um, but really this video is going to be some of my thoughts about kind of what's going on in my life. But also, um, I've been listening to a lot of like MGTOW um, and um, more recent videos by MRAs. Um, and there's a lot of like um, comparing between men and women um, and um, a, a, a lot of like women bashing basically going on, which is fine as usual. Um, but what I want to talk about was I think those hearing those stories and um, reading people's testimonies of what happens to them um, in their life and how their lives get destroyed because of the law and things like that kind of made me think about my life, especially recently because I've had some really big events happening to me recently. Um, you know, I got my PhD and then I got like a postdoc position. So that's good. But then, but then like a few days ago, well, like more like last week, my cat died and it might sound trite, but she's been with in the family for 17 and a half years. So she's almost like my little baby. And uh, um, I've been prepared for it for probably more than three years. But um, it really took a really hard hit on my parents, especially my dad, who's, who actually cried for days. And I've never seen him cry before. Um, and then as the result of that, uh, my parents start to, you know, become desperate, so to speak, uh, regarding me and my situation. And they really, really, really want to pressure me to um, find someone, get married and have a child. And um, I think it kind of like my cat's death kind of made me think about, well, coming to the U.S. and um, if I choose not to have a child, they feel like they won't have any descendants and um, they feel like it's, it would be all for nothing. Um, and one of the things that really hurts my mom was me telling her very honestly that one of the reasons why I don't want to have a child is because um, when I think about my life in general, after, after my childhood, I can't really say it's been a particularly happy one. Um, and this isn't, a, a lot of it isn't because of my parents. It's just how the society is, really, um, and how I am. So, and of course, a lot of that is um, internal. A lot of that is mental, but still, I mean, you are the way you are. Um, and, um, and it's not that I don't think um, I have a happy family or something, because like I said, it's after childhood, like I had a really happy childhood and it kind of just went downhill after that. Um, and it's also not that I'm not satisfied or anything because for me, uh, happiness and being satisfied and content with your life are kind of two different things. You can be grateful uh, for a lot of things in your life, you can be satisfied, but that doesn't necessarily mean you will be happy because it's kind of on another dimension for me. And why that is, is, you know, I thought about why that is, and I kind of realized that I have a lot of things in common with um, the people in the men's movement who talk about their life and um, um, what they have experienced. I can't really say it's exactly the same, but uh, my parents have noticed that I have more of a, a boy personality. Um, and part of that is also how I was raised. So I think that that's kind of what I want to talk about, kind of want to give you guys an idea of the things that I've been through and how I um, became a feminist and then drop out of being the feminist, sort of. Um, and it isn't just because 
like I have a reasonable mind or I'm necessarily smarter than most people or anything is really a lot of that is really because I can sympathize with uh, a lot of men because what they've gone through is a lot of similar to what I've gone through. Um, so it kind of probably started with when I was a baby and my mother, who's really been my my model in lot in, in a lot of this, uh, she was when she was when she had me, um, and she, when she was having me when she was pregnant, she was in grad school, and during that time, life is just really hard. It's in China, and it was just a couple of, of um, decades after the Cultural Revolution, and my mother's family has been really hit really hard. So a lot of people are really used to like hardships, like hardships that probably most Americans haven't gone through. Um, and because of that, they just, uh, they're, they're really, you know, sharpened as a knife, almost like very strong people, uh, very sharp and uh, very motivated to um, become better. At least that's the case for, for both of my parents. And after my mom had me, she's still really determined to, um, you know, get her master's, get a professorship and all that stuff. Um, and so that's kind of contrary to kind of the Western idea. A, a lot of the uh, people in the men's movement, they think like women shouldn't have a career and have a child uh, and... Um, and be raising a child at the same time because um, they should just be primarily focused on raising the child, especially when the child's young. Um, and the way that my mom handled this was really, she kind of just left me. I mean, she had friends to help her, but a lot of times that she left me alone. So I was like, I don't know, like three or four years old or something. And before that, she asked like her mother, my grandmother for help. Um, and uh, she'll left me alone in the house, she'll lock me in, and she'll give me some toys, and she'll just basically not, uh, she'll go and do her thing and not basically looking after me. Um, and part of that is because she discovered, like, I had this personality, maybe it was inborn, that I don't cry so much as other babies uh, at that age. And I seem to have some sort of lack of, like, attachment relative to a lot of other babies. Um, for example, one time that she told me that she left me at my grandmother's house for just like two or three weeks. And after that, I don't seem to have recognized her. Of course, I don't remember any of this, but uh, that really made her sad. Um, but then after, after a while, like I obviously recognized her. Um, and that has been kind of the case, like I would be like really absorbing my toys in my own little world and, and I would be fine, basically. So, and that kind of shocked a lot of the people, even back then. Like, they would look through the window at our little cottage, uh, our rain-leaking cottage, um, and, uh, and see just me there by myself with a bunch of toys, and there's no one around. Um, and, and then other, other things that she did was really she, again, because she has to study really hard and also become like a wife, um, she just develops self, several strategies, like if I'm hurt, um, if, I, um, if I run into some kind of trouble and I'm about to cry, um, she'll either distract me or when I get a little older, she'll kind of, uh, kind of tell me like it's pathetic, you don't cry. So that's, so that's one of the really similar things with the boys don't cry, like I've really been through that. Um, it was never a case of me crying and my parents um, come and cuddle me and things like that. Oh, it's okay, baby. No, I've never experienced that. It was especially when I was little. Um, when I was little, if I cry, they would try to like tell me to stop, like shame me to stop, or uh, try to do something to distract me so I stop crying, basically. Um, so that I, I think that was one of the reasons why. Um, even during like school, so this was when I was in grade school, 
um, I started to develop like the, the teacher there are really freaking mean, like especially our elementary school teacher. She's very good at keeping order. Don't get me wrong, but I don't agree with her methods. Um, it's it's one of those like punishing punishment methods, which works really well temporarily, but you can kind of tell like when she stopped being our teacher, uh, and another teacher who's not a, who's not as mean. Um, basically, like all the kids just come completely crazy like bad you know it was almost like oh, freedom now we get to do whatever we want um, so this teacher was really particularly mean and of course like everybody once in a while would get into trouble and I got into trouble and the other girls when they get into trouble they just break down like they just cry and again these teachers are really mean like uh, she would literally lecture about something close to like something com comparable to like hell house that you would um, uh, see in fundamental churches but instead of hell right this was a communist country like atheistic she would talk about juvenile halls and about like how they would torture you if you're bad and things like that and she's very serious about this it's not a joking matter um <clears throat> so uh, she would she would like scare us with all stuff and it's all come down to you how to study hard basically like Academia is essentially like the religion of the Chinese people, honestly. I'm not even kidding about this. Um, and, um, and so the several times I got in trouble, I just, I just have this feeling of like rebellion. Like I was just like, you know, I just feel like it's, um, um, I, I will not cry. Like I will not show weakness. And this has pretty much been my entire life. Like if I show weakness, if I cry, then um, I... I feel really, really ashamed, and uh, and it's really con it's kind of weird to me um, to see nowadays that I think in the United States they even encourage, especially uh, women, to cry. Um, so then women become like hysterical, like uh, when when they have some when they lose someone or let's say lose their pet, they would become like absolutely hysterical. They would cry like really, really, really loud. I guess it's because it's kind of encouraged. But again, like for me, like it's just really weird because again, when I was growing up, crying is showing weakness and you don't do that. Um, so there's that. And then, and then um, when it comes to my parents, my family is, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a very different family from a lot of the Chinese family from that generation necessarily, but it is very different from the Western family that you will you, you would know. Not just because both of my parents work full time pretty much uh, all of their life. I mean, I mean, ever since they could get a job, but it's because um, my mom, <clears throat> she um, she works just as hard as my dad. I mean, sometimes maybe even more so. I mean, my mom is a, a software engineer. My dad is a hardware engineer. Uh, which one is harder is really debatable because, you know, you could software engineers, they constantly have to update their knowledge and um, uh, about like what's, what is new, learn new things, whereas hardware, um, it might be a little bit more difficult to learn, but then it's more stable. So whatever. I mean, it's complicated. I wouldn't know. I do know that both of them are engineers in um, computer and uh, um, some hardware and... Uh, <coughs> Um, and both of them work, work full-time. Um, and in the case of my parents, the, the family dynamic is it's, it's not the worst kind, but it's, I think by Western standard, it's very patriarchal um, in such a way that my mom, every, every single... So my mom earns about half, like really, really half of the total family income, and she gives her half, all of it, to my dad every single month. I know, it's like, it's crazy. Um, and in fact, what's even more crazy is every single time if she wants to spend money on something, she has to get my dad's permission, even though she earns half of the family income. Yeah, like this is how she is. This is why she influenced me a lot in my life. Like growing up, I have never thought that there's any possibility that uh, you that when I grow up I would live off of like a husband or something like that that I didn't know that you could I didn't know that people did that 
until I grew up. Like I realized that there's such thing as housewife. I mean, it makes sense then, because I realized just how hard it is to get a job, and uh, uh, and a lot of people are struggling. But um, before then, like I just thought the typical family is that both adults work, and it was absurd that an adult would be dependent like a child uh, to another adult. Like that was just yeah really weird to me. And, and yeah, I mean, it might sound naive. Um, you you might add, you you might ask me, well, what what about those? You know, don't you know about the people who inherit money and things like that? No, I didn't. Really, I didn't. Uh, I didn't know how aristocracy worked. Even um, I didn't know how they got their money. I, I mean, I was a kid. I don't think about those things. All I know is, um, growing up, they also constantly drilling me about like you have to study hard, otherwise you won't be able to find a good job. You won't be able to, you know. Um, uh, survive on your own and things like that. So you need to do that, do that, do that. Because again, like I said, academia is like the god of the Chinese people. They don't care about anything else. And from from some perspective, I almost wish that they would, um, w you know, when they were uh, raising me, they would teach me a little bit more other kind of practical skills. And it's not that they didn't try at all, but because I'm somebody who cannot multitask very well, that's another like thing that I'm more closer to men. Um, my mom can, for example, do five things at the same time. I just cannot do that. Um, so they have to choose between teaching me like all the other stuff that I think like a typical Western family do teach their kids and academia, and they chose academia. And also one of the reasons why they chose academia is also because they're surrounded, their community, their micro-community uh, are is filled with people with kids who are extremely accomplished ac academically. This is just part of the culture. And as part of the culture, and this is part I really, really hate, but this is how it is, um, they compare the kids to each other, like a lot. Um, and I think like in the West, it doesn't happen so much, but in like in a Chinese culture, this is like a huge thing. Um, if you have friends who have kids who's really accomplished, then uh, you would tell your kid. And even if you don't tell your kid, uh, why can't you be more like him or her? It's pretty much an unspoken thing. Like it's, you're just like, you're just pretty much flashing somebody who's better than you and to kind of almost sh to shame you into becoming better too, kind of like that. Now, the problem was this tactic didn't work as well on me uh, as they had hoped. So for them, because they're such high level people, I mean, high level as in um, social economic status, I guess, um, and education, they would be having friends who are in that group, right? I mean, their friends would also be um, high-skilled workers, um, engineers, doctors, whatever, with very high adv advanced degrees. And, um, and they would have children who tend to be very, very competitive. Um, and so when the competitiveness started to become really um, intense, um, it just, I think I just started to sort of not being able to meet the higher and higher standard basically the standard was already high but then it just start popping out more and more kids my age who are just more and more and more and more and more accomplished and this was of course already when I was in the US so um, so I think like to, to put it frank pretty much from middle school prob probably like um, towards the end of middle school all the way to uh, even college, I felt like a failure. That's, that was pretty much the entire thing about me and my existence. And in fact, the other day when I was flipping through the albums, you know, to have a memory of my cat, uh, I started to remember those kind of feelings, pretty much. Just sort of a pushing force to become a competitor, but I really cannot compete with those people. Um, and, um, and those people really, their existence, their behavior um, just kind of constantly reminded me like I'm kind of a failure. Um, and um, 
on top of that, what makes thing, things worse was when you were in high school, that, that's already starting sort of your, um, uh, how should I put this, like place in society. Like you're already entering like a phase where you need to be sort of confirmed of your uh, status in society. Like what is your status? People are competing for status now during that time. And in high school, so not only was, like, my grades are not bad, don't get me wrong, but they're compared to um, the people that um, my mom associate me with, my parents associate with me, uh, me with in general, they're bad. So compared to those people, they're bad. And, um, and on top of that, like, I was pretty much an ugly teenager. Um, yeah, I mean, like, it's true. And... People have told me this, like, flat out. Um, I mean, Chinese people can be incredibly, incredibly straightforward about this. And this is not really them being mean, like, because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, nah, they're just mean kids. No, I mean, uh, maybe one or two um, in middle school they were being mean. But I'm talking about, like, like Chinese people who kind of were my friends, like... You know, I mean, they don't have any reason to be mean to me. And and you can tell that they're being very, very honest about it. And I can also see it from, you know, other how other people look at me, too. Like, um, if you're an attractive person, especially in high school, okay, where people are, are starting to have really big horm hormonal reactions, especially on the part of men, uh, you would know. You would pretty much know. So I kind of know that, like, well, I, I don't want to say I'm like the, the, the lower of the, very low of the curve per se, but probably below average. So there's also that. Um, and there are a lot of kids in my high school, which is a very top high school, uh, girls who are like good looking and accomplished. And I think like my parents, even though they don't say it, they do feel very ashamed um, about like about me, about a lot of things. And this is particularly true for my dad. So the thing with my dad is I, um, I don't have anything to complain about when it comes to um, financial support, when it comes to all the help he gave me for school, and also even the discipline um, that I, um, he had for me when I was a child, even though I don't agree with his methods very much, but whatever. I mean, it, it, it worked out somewhat. But there are other things, like things that eventually became very important in my life that I just really, like, I almost really hate him for it because the behavior that he displays is, is like, it's from a very backward culture. Like, um, you could call it patriarchal, traditional culture, whatever. And it's <laughs> almost a stereotypical toxic masculinity 101, um, you know, from what you, you, what you hear from the feminist. For example, like, uh, if I accomplish something, it's his pride, you know, if, if something's hap bad happened to me, it's his shame. If I'm doing something that really isn't hurting anybody even, but it's not like the conventional thing, um, then um, he, he feels like he cannot hold up his head in his family. Basically, he feels really much ashamed, even though I'm not really hurting anybody. Um, for example, what happened was like this... My ex, who I dated, um, he separated from um, his ex-wife, and uh, we connected, and his wife also left, you know, like he wasn't living with her or anything. Um, but they were in the process of divorce, but they haven't finalized it, and that was a big issue for my dad, especially. Um, and he was, he basically told me several times to the extent of, I'm a slut, pretty much. Um, and, um, and so, like, so there's just, like, all of that, like, adding together, like, even when I got my PhD, like, he, uh, because he never got his PhD, because he, before he could get, like, the, um, the degree, um, he came to the U.S., and it was, like, oh, he feels like there's, like, a, it's, it's, you know, I bring pride to, like, some honor to, like, his side of the family, which is, in a, patriarchal society is just like his family like because he's the head of the household you know <laughs> um 
So like pretty much like me and my mom are part of his family. Like it's not, you know, half and half or anything. It's just like that. It's just a very traditional um, society that you don't really see in the West anymore, except for maybe fundamentalist Christians. Um, so, so I think all of that like, and and on top of that, there's even one other thing was ever since I was a toddler, my dad sort of plays me like almost like a toy, and he even admits it. He would like tease me and touch me in places like not sexually. Don't worry. But still, like, when you grow up to a certain age, they feel really inappropriate. And I remember having a lot of rage. I even can feel the rage I have for those things. But even, I mean, he eventually stopped. But still, like, I just felt like I was an object, you know, when he, when he did something like that. Um, so just all of that just added to the point of me um, really, really um, become, like, a kind of a rebellious person, have a very... Being very become very aggressive, um, and um, pretty. Um, I I don't know, just um, pr pretty much like a very hard chick almost kind of personality. Um, and uh, and my mom was at one point telling me like you shouldn't be like that. You should like be gentle as water or some bullshit because you're a woman. Um, and you can see like this is why I found the ideology of feminism so attractive. Like, everything they say was what I experienced, was what I rebelled against. Um, and um, I guess in some way I uh, uh, subscribe to that ideology because I wanted to feel, I really wanted to feel good about myself, and I wasn't. So I had just so much insecurity. And I want to feel strong, and uh, I wanted feel like I can handle things um, and so that was why like I was a feminist and the version of feminism that I subscribed to wasn't like the modern kind of feminism where it's about like you know making guys do things for you which is weird because it's pretty much just patriarchy all over but it was a but it was a um, kind of a feminism regarding not just women liberation, but, uh, and uh, women independence, but also just women taking control of their life, pretty much. And I felt like I never really had that uh, when I was, uh, you know, before I was a feminist. Um, so, but at the same time, no, because in, in some way, um, because I've been through a lot of these things, I can also connect with people, whether they're men or women, who also been through this kind of things, um, and it's and it's just really strange that throughout my whole life it has been boys, it has been men, uh, who who has been my friends, and I think like it's because they, uh, and this was like when they're younger, right? So this was before men started become, you know, um, start to seek out their partner, and then they prefer more feminine women, which I am not. But when you're much younger, you haven't gone into that point yet, um, you want to be with people who are similar to you, right? So that's why I end up having a lot of friends who are boys, basically. And even till today, like, um, I, it's very easy for me to make a friend who's a, who's a guy. I literally would have friends who are married and who would tell me that they would never want to marry me and, you know, want me to be their wife. But after they're married, they would behind their wife's back and call me once in a while to, to talk to me about things that they would never, they know they could never um, discuss with their wife. They would never have the same conversation with, with uh, their wife about. Um, she would probably like slam the door in his face and leave. Um, so, th so then like I get friend zoned a lot by men pretty much. Um, and, and the thing was when it comes to relationships, I had to find out the hard way that because I'm an only child, the relationships that I had in my head tend to be completely influenced and come from basically the movies and TVs I watch, you know. Um, and when I watch those TV, especially like Asian dramas, when I watch those shows, I would go into my head like, oh, this woman is doing this wrong and I'm not going to do something like that. Or um, this woman is being like bad in this way. Um, I'm not gonna do something like that, right? 
Um, you might think it's good, but then like when I was when I started dating, I realized it's really not like that. Like men have their own expectations, and especially in in this age where um, standards of living just gone a lot better, and there's a lot of romantic ideas going on in the West for centuries now. Uh, even though women are still still the more choosy one, men. You know, they're, they're still, like, choosier than the last generation and definitely choosier than probably the average men in China. <coughs> and even the Chinese men in, um, in the U.S., um, when they live here long enough and become an American citizen, they would be influenced by that, too. And they have high, standard, high standards. And this is especially true for type of guy um, that my parents would like me to have. Um, and it's a very uh, specific group. It's not just anybody, obviously. They want like a guy who's, well, I mean, first of all, they wanted to, him to be Chinese, right? Um, but of course, he can't just be any Chinese as it come from like a family like my family, like a middle class or upper middle, middle class where both parents are educated. Um, you know, well-educated, at least, like, have a master's or something, and they want him to have uh, a career in a very marketable job, like programmer, engineer, doctor, or or something like that. Um, Business owner probably is fine, and they want him to also have an advanced degree, like a master's at least. Um, So also, you can imagine this is a very, like, elite group. Um, and the men in this elite group, they have pretty high standards for the kind of women that they want to look for. And their standard of women is like, oh, women who's beautiful, accomplished, plays the piano, you know, know how to cook, knows how to be a housewife, don't talk too much, very sweet, and, uh, and you know, all of that stuff. Like, holy fucking shit. Like, I t- kid you not. So... I think like it's hard for them to fathom why like they they just like why I can't end up with someone like that because it's really freaking hard um and because they just uh, they just they just think it's all me basically um they think that oh it's because you're too choosy and yada 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 but not really like my experience has been the opposite my experience has been like any because like I used to be a feminist and I was one of those like uh, feminists who do take um, accountability. <laughs> I mean, it it's almost sounds like oxymoron, but that was actually the core belief of the feminism that I sub- subscribe to. Like, it's about women taking control, right? So I just always thought, well, you know, uh, why wait for the guy to come chasing after you? Like, if you like a guy, you go after him, right? And so, so that's also another thing that I connect with a lot of men, um, because, yeah, I was, mostly, I was the chaser, like, I don't know if I can be believed in saying this, but it was true, like, I see a guy, I go after, like, I I go and um, take the first step, I don't wait for the guy to come and, um, you know, date me or something like that, um, and the experience pretty much has been um, rejection, pretty much. Um, so tons of rejection and, um, and of course, like during that time, I don't feel like I'm shooting for the stars and some, for a lot of these men, they really are not the stars. Like I'm really not shooting for like the class prince or some shit like that. Um, but they even, I don't know, even the more average men within this elite group, they have like a very, they have very high standards. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it was pretty much rejection for, like, nine out of ten times. Um, and that really hurt. And, and the other, you know, one out of ten times has been regarding men who uh, kind of use me as a back door. So they are kind of low on the scale, so they fit some of these categories, but they're not particularly attractive, and they don't really have... Uh, the best kind of uh, uh, masculine personality, so to speak, and uh, and they come after me because they couldn't find anybody else, at least at that moment, and they're sort of desperate. 
Um, and I've literally had an experience, the first guy I dated, <laughs> uh, I was actually, again, like I was the one who was the kind of the chaser, right? I, I hooked him up. And, um, and after three weeks, I feel like we don't really have anything in common, but I was really young and I was like 18. So I thought, oh, whatever, um, let's try it a bit longer. It's an experience, right? Um, but he was the one who like broke up with me. He just kind of went like, you like books and stuff. We don't really have anything coming. Yeah, he actually said that. Um, and then so I said, is this the only reason? And he said, well, the other reason is like, I, um, I want to date somebody else. So I'm just like, okay, whatever. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but in my mind, I kind of go like, yeah, <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> Because I know, like, this other woman that he wanted to date is probably, like, a better woman than me. Um, and, uh, and it's, yeah. So anyways, I was right, and uh, that woman pretty much, that girl pretty much rejected him. And then he wanted to come back to me, because I was still available, right? He wanted to come back to me, uh, and, and I just... So, because it was at a point where... I just feel like, and this was a start of me developing myself, the start of me just kind of going like, you know what, at the end of the day, I want to have self-respect. I'm really sick of feeling like a failure all the time and not have that self-respect. I need to have self-respect. I need to value things about myself. And this is not uh, something that would help me do that, like being like the back door of men, like of men who gets rejected. Um, so yeah, so of course, like I said, no. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, guys, you should say no too. Like if you have like a, a woman who's using you as a backdoor, don't, okay? Like it doesn't matter how good looking or sexy or uh, hot she is to you. Um, if she wants to date somebody else over you and using you as a backdoor, you say no, okay? I mean, uh, it's really not worth abasing yourself like this. Just say no. Um, and like another guy that my mom uh, tried to arrange marriage me with was actually a childhood friend of mine, like a really nice guy. But again, like I felt he was also doing kind of doing that. When somebody really likes you, you can tell. You can tell when somebody really likes you. Um, and when somebody is just really dating you for the sake of some sort of pressure, social pressure, you can tell too. You know. So, so yeah. Um, this is how eventually like just pretty much year after year, um, I just sort of, I started to just sort of like slowly give up and, um, and even, and, and also just slowly, um, just, uh, becoming kind of solitary, you know, almost like a cat. This is why I'm like, I'm like a cat person because like when I look at cat, when I look at my cat, you know, like they, they're solitary creatures, but they always look like they have self-respect. And even when they're dying, they wanted to die alone. They don't want like any loved one to be beside them, to see them in a state like this, right? They wanted to um, just quietly go away, hide somewhere and, and just die. And that's kind of what I want to be eventually. I even said that I want to be an ice queen, pretty much. Um, it, just something that in, in which like nothing can really hurt me anymore and I get desensitized for every, you know for everything and that was sort of the goal I started to work towards and and a lot of that you know a lot of times that people would say well you know you should keep trying and things like that but one of the problem with me is that I'm actually a bit oversensitive so that was one of the things that I tried to uh, improve myself to not be so sensitive I was a very sensitive child um, and with everything going on, it just it didn't really help with that sensitivity, really. Um, and uh, and so I just and and but at the same time, because of the way I was raised, like like I said before, um, being sensitive is also like a weakness. Um, it's 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 something to be sh ashamed about. So then um, I really just uh, I really just control all of that. I stop being sensitive, but. The thing about, you know, relationship is, it's just that once I um, invest into it, if it doesn't work out, it really devastates me. Like, you know, there was a guy I really liked, um, and we had like a one night stand. Um, after that, he 
broke it off with me. And by the way, that guy was also me chasing after him, just just in case you were wondering. Um, and he he had his whatever his situation. He broke it off with me after like one night. Well, I mean, I don't know if breaking off is even the right term here, but you know what I mean. Um, and uh, and it was devastating me for like three weeks, and I can't work, I can't do anything, and I just realized that this is really not worth it. Like I, the most important thing for me is to be able to survive in this society, um, and I can't trade. Um, I, I can't I can't trade that for anything else. Like I can't trade that for love. Basically, it's it's not worth it for me because um, at least um, if I get a job that I can survive in this world, that's something that I can still survive. I can control, but I can't control somebody else. You know, I I cannot really um, make a guy like love me or anything. So so that was that kind of just developed more and more into, and I think my parents don't really get it, but. Really, every single time, and, and they're constantly about this now. Like it's really starting to annoy me. They're constantly trying to go in, like, "Oh, you need to keep trying, trying, trying." And I just have this like really bad feeling every single time they say that. They're like, you know, like, uh, kind of like a phobia almost, um, kind of a really big phobia. And it's not because like I'm. I, I think like the feeling that I give off of people is like, oh, you're too proud of things. Like, it's, it's really not that. It's really be- not because of pride or anything. It's just because of this, it's the feeling from the, the particular experience that I had, which is that, um, like, I'm, I cannot control um, this kind of sensitivity regarding um, feelings, regarding relationship. It's just something that I cannot overcome, and anything that's if if it doesn't work out, anything bad happening, I just cannot um, handle it very well, and I have to handle it. Like I can, I don't have like whole month, you know, to get over it. I kind of I have to work, you know. So uh, um, so that's why like I just don't want, don't want to touch that water almost. So this is why like when I see a lot of the men, the MGTOW, the the men in the men's movement, they talk about this, and of course like. They, um, a lot of them had like even worse, like many times worse experience than I had, right? Like regarding law, regarding losing your kids and things like that. But still, it's one of degree not kind. It's the same kind of phobia that I can relate to. It's the phobia of I was really, really hurt um, for whatever reason, um, and it has been like a continuous experience um, of of getting hurt, and so it's really not worth it, right? So I can totally, totally understand that. And I think like it's, the difference between me and feminists is that they um, think it only happens to women for some reason, not men. Um, I never, I never thought that was possible. I I never had that um, ideology in my head. Even when I was a very strong feminist and I had a book like natural superiority of women, like, I never separated them, because for me, you know, gender equality, gender equality, men and women are the same, or whatever, I mean, I don't, I think it's more complicated than that now, but, you know, like, a man is a human being, a woman's a human being, so it doesn't really make sense to me that things that women experience, men wouldn't experience, like, I never had this, um, this ideology, at at least very strong, like, I used to think that there are things that men don't experience that women do, that men don't experience as much as women, um, but then I always thought vice versa is probably true, or um, or maybe like, or maybe it could be true, like I could be convinced of that, that it would be true when I was a feminist, um, but you know, it's, but still like, it's just, I think it's, um, like I said, it's the way I was raised, um, Part of it is probably my nature. I think, a, but I think a huge chunk of it was the way I was raised, um, and it, the the it's kind of interesting to me that I think people say that feminists are the way they are because of their own insecurities. While I don't think that's necessarily uh, incorrect, I think actually it could be a lot of times the opposite. I think they a lot of the feminists are really just too confident about themselves. I think they're too secure. 
or if they're insecure, they don't recognize it, their insecurity. Like they, they're they're very good at burying it, um, and that's something that I couldn't do. Um, I just recognize my insecurity like all the time, and because of the way that I was raised, I have to because there's my parents and constantly every single day showing me things that it's going to bring out my insecurity. Um, so with that kind of insecurity, like comes with a lot of wanting sympathy, um, but then the wanting sympathy kind of becomes, um, you know, having sympathy for other people. So that just kind of became a chain reaction for me. So that's why, like, when I um, hear, uh, eventually when I hear the different side of the argument, I can really relate to that. So I cannot just outright throw them out of the water. Um, so that's how I, like, you know, slowly came out of feminism. And now, like, I can't even subscribe myself to the, fem the, feminist, the feminism that I subscribe myself to. Um, also because um, I realize things are more complicated. Um, it's not even an ideology um, about gender equality. Is that, you know, men and women probably cannot um, have equal roles without really fucking up the society. I think it, that's the part of the big nature that we cannot completely overcome. I mean, uh, certainly there are uh, women who can do the men's job just as well and vice versa, but if you're really forcefully trying to get 50-50 into everything, like even if you're, if you're like a radical feminist but you're really serious about gender equality um, and you push women into minds, um, that's probably going to devastate the society. Um, and in fact, I even suspect that if women were to work jobs as hard as men um, do, maybe women would live even shorter life than men. That's, all, that's a possibility, really. So, so yeah, so anyways, um, I think it's a pretty long rant, <laughs> um, but it kind of, but I hopefully it kind of gives you kind of an idea like where I come from and why I'm one of the unicorns. Um, <laughs> we do exist. Um, and uh, yeah, and be, I guess the only thing that I want to say, the message is every individual is different. Um, you, you want to be more skeptical. Um, you want to really open your mind and think about all possibilities. Um, and that's really how you become wiser, really. This is basically what I learned in my journey in life. And, uh, and even though in the future, like, I really kind of don't see myself as kind of the, uh, you know, some, you know, living with a guy and uh, start a family or anything. And uh, um, if I could reach the goal of having a stable job and living a comfortable life on my own with two or three cats, that's pretty, that's, I'm satisfied. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not necessarily saying I could be completely happy, but... I would say it's an accomplishment, and my personal accomplishment has been, and this is how I felt, has been building that character, you know, um, you know trying to overcome, like, the weakness, weaknesses that um, I feel ashamed of, but the ones that I could overcome anyways. Um, and, um, and just uh, uh, learning to value myself, and also don't ever give up on the things that matters, matter to you. Um, and really those things will eventually, you know, make you a better person and, and concentrating on most things would, um, prevent you from, uh, you know, believing in, in ideology, ideology as, as absurd as feminism. This is what I really think. So, yeah. Anyways, um, I don't know when the next video will be, but, um, I'm happy to discuss anything. Um, if you like, um, and uh, I, again, um, I hope you guys had to have a um, happy new year so far. Bye!